Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In today's video, I'm bringing you a book review, but it's going to be a bit different because this started as a conversation on another YouTube channel. Uh, Clemson University posted a video. The video is about four years old, but this conversation sparked about two months ago when it happened to be on my recommendations. I clicked on it and the video was about um, the life of Umar bin Said, a, an African slave who was Muslim. So in the video, towards the end of it, some of the scholars who were speaking, uh, they were doctors and professors, they were speaking and mentioned that he converted to Christianity towards the end of his life. And I challenged that with a question in the comment section or with a statement saying that I don't believe he became a, he converted to Christianity. He may have been doing certain things to protect his life because he knows the value of life. So, um, underneath my comment that sparked conversation and people were asking, can you uh, please, you know, make your review on it because I did mention, I said, okay, you know what, I'll buy the book and I'll read it and make a video review on it. So some people were saying, yes, please do that. And, you know, once this book review is completed, I'll leave the link there, inshallah. So I'm just, this is just to let my regular viewers know where this all sparked from. Now, um, I wanted to start a bit with my own history here which is that of uh, African-American descent, if you will. We're not sure if we were here before slaves were brought to America or if we actually descend from Africa. However, um, it all has to do with... Th the purpose, I should say, of this review is because once I read the book, um, a lot of the life of Umar bin Said or his practices paralleled a lot with um, what I found in my own community or what I found my own life to be like growing up in my community and I want to share this with you all because it really hit home for me also I told the people that I would make a book review on it and leave them the link so back to this book here was composed and printed in my community uh, 20 years ago because it was printed in 1999 and in here there's a passage, it, talk, it talks about uh, um, what, when Islam first comes to America, and um, it explains, I'm just going to read it briefly here. It says, the history of Islam in America has always been as synonymous with the African American experience, thus limiting its historical definitions for the most part to black nationalism and the nation of Islam. However, Islam in America has been and is much more than that, okay? Its time on the shores of, of the North American continent supersedes the temporal confines of the 20th century and is linked directly with the, with the Al Islam of the East and most likely came from here first on the African Arabian trade winds. Now, moving on to another passage or line, it says, it does not take a stretch of one's imagination to realize that Muslims had to have been amongst the victims of slave abductions. Now, on to the part that has always captured me, like from the time that this book was first printed. It says, perhaps you can envision those centuries ago when our African ancestors were forced to come here and forced to practice their religion in secret and hide their daily prayers that they made supplications to our Rabb that if it were not his plan to deliver them, then deliver their progeny and preserve for this progeny the power and glory of Al-Islam and, and the promise of Allah, okay? So, because that has always, like, it's really resonated with me. When I came across the video that was talking about this book on Clemson University's website or on their YouTube channel, I was intrigued and after reading it I have to say okay my first impression of the book I don't really I'm 
unimpressed by the copy that they afforded the reader. It appears to me, and I'll put a closer shot in here, because Alhamdulillah I was able to find, or a friend of mine, when I was discussing it with her, she sent me some very clear copies. So I'll see if I can post them up here. But I, I, I found that it just appeared that they didn't think anyone would really try to read it or would care enough to read it. However, I do. I care enough to read the Arabic for myself and translate it and find out what is really being said in his book, you know? So, um, to get started, I did mark some pages. Oh, I'll try to, I don't think it's going to pick up properly on this camera, so I'll try to post the picture closer. And pardon, if there's any sound or background noise, I, you know, I'm at home, this is, you know, my family, we live here, so you may hear some sounds from time to time, it's okay. So getting started, I've marked a few pages here that um, I wanted to talk about because I'm not going to go into exactly how they translated it and everything that they said about his story, but I did want to touch on the Arabic and the Holy Quranic and the Hadith parts because even the composer or the, the translators and the scholars who studied it, they seem to still have questions and it seemed rather, I don't want to say easy because I don't, this is not intended to disrespect anyone, but the questions that they had just seemed rather simple to figure out if you have studied in depth or at all um, Holy Quran or Quranic Arabic or um, surahs. Um, so I wanted to try to make that clear for some people who may not be that familiar with Arabic. Um, that first off, they have people translating it like um, Alan Austin, for example, who is like, he's really trying to make people believe that um, Umar bin Said converted to Christianity, but I would encourage someone like that to talk to a Muslim of African American descent who is well versed in Arabic, Quranic Arabic, or Hadith. You know, because um, we can tell you that this is it, this is not the case, especially after reading his story. That's not the case. He didn't convert to anything. He stayed very strong Muslim throughout um, his life, which is clear from his own writings. So um, on to the next. I think Isaac Bird was uh, another person who tried to. Um, print and studied and all this and while we appreciate them putting this book out there and everything I strongly feel like they should have um, dug deeper or found someone who speaks whose native language is Arabic or who studied in a university or of some sort uh, Holy Quran in depth okay because we'll just start off with Surah Al-Nasr right here I'll try to put a closer picture of it but it says, it starts off, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, because uh, um, Omar bin Said wrote this with his own hand. It says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحٌ قَرِيبٌ وَبَشِرِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ So here, already, I see two surahs mixed in one, right? And it says, at the bottom, I'm going to try to put this picture up for you, but it says Omar's latest known extent writing, a copy of Surah Al Nasr, but with spurious emendation, 1857, North Carolina Collection, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Anyone who studies Holy Quran would know that these are lines from two different surahs. So you have Ida Ja An Nasrullah Wal Fatih, which is from Surah Al Nasr, and then you have Wafathun Qarib, which is from Surah to Saf. So Surah to Saf is um, Surah 61. This line is Ayat 13. Surah 61, Ayat 13. So yeah, Surah to Saf. I remember that, like the first time when I was learning about Surah to Saf, um, 
beautiful recitation by a man we know as Hazrat Hassan Abu Bakr radiallahu um, Allah be pleased with him. And he recited Nasrun min Allah wa fathun qareeb. It's the same Surah to Saf from all those years ago when he recited and even further back, dates even further back to when uh, Umar bin Said uh, wrote it in here. But you have to give him some uh, grace because although we don't mix ayats at his age and he's running writing this based off of his memory, it all it all, it's all encompassing. Like Idaja and Rasulullah, when the help from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala comes, and at the same time he says Wafathun Qarib and the victory is near. He just mixed two lines and then he finishes the surah out. Um, so he finishes the surah out, but it's unclear to who, the people who composed this book about him, and they're saying they they think that he just inserted his own thoughts, or they're implying that he inserted his own thoughts. But this is actually it's all holy Quran. So that's to answer the the, the first ambiguous note at the bot footnote at the bottom um, it's just two lines from Holy Quran that he mixed together because they're very similar and this happens a lot that's why when you have a Hafiz reciting there's usually another Hafiz or a backup Hafiz uh, in the ranks because a lot of the lines are repetitive so something may sound like um, it, it starts or ends a certain way and then you have your backup Hafiz who corrects it inshallah so then you have the next line that they or the next section that they covered in the video in the Clemson University video that speaks about um, Surah al -Mulk. so I was comparing them and I have a Holy Quran right here I was comparing the notes from Surah al -Mulk, and I'm just I'll get to my, my point um, and he writes in certain lines or certain words, he writes them with a sheen instead of a scene. And in Holy Quran, it is with a scene. For example, um, where does he say it? Sha'ir. It, it should be Sa'ir. Where is it? Khashi'an wa huwa hashir. That's what he wrote. It should be Khashi'an wa huwa hasir. But like I said, he, we can give him some grace because it's either at his age or the fact that he did not did not have a an Arabic Holy Quran when he was writing this down. Otherwise, he probably would have read that and and copied it verbatim. But there are some letters that that are changed up. For example, in Surah Al-Fatiha, he writes the scene where it belongs, but. In Surah Al-Mulk, he writes a sheen where there should be a scene, and which means he's going off of memory. And Subhanallah, he completes Surah Al-Mulk as best as his knowledge, the entire surah. And they're concerned that he wrote something twice. And a lot of the times in Holy Quran or recitation of Holy Quran the reciter will repeat the lines. So the fact that he repeated uh, or he stopped, they men made mention that he repeats, it says, Umar repeats a part of an earlier verse above and omits the subsequent verse which reads, and then they, you know, they translate it. But a lot of the times um, when we recite Holy Quran, we may go over it, that, that line again, we might stop and then recite it again for emphasis and if he did this at the end more than likely this is what he's doing the same thing we do in 2019 is what he's doing back in his year so then we come to the letter where again I'll try to put this on the screen but the translation here um, is so questionable to me just going off of what I see here it says, um, 
I'm going to try to read it as best as I can because there, there is a clearer copy online. Like I said, I'll try to put the picture. But it says, uh, Ya Sheikh Hunter, or talking to Mr. Hunter. Sheikh can translate to Mr., Sir, Kind Sir, uh, someone who's elder than you. It's a respectful way of speaking. All right? Um, Ana la yastati'u an yaktub al hayati. And it means like, I cannot write my life. I have forgotten. Okay, I'm sorry. Ananasya, like as in Ananasitu, I've forgotten. Kathiran, Kathiran, or Kathir al Kalam. Kalam means words. And from what I can see, he's using all the Arabic that he can remember. Apparently, he has studied Arabic, although Arabic is not his first language. He is using as much Arabic as he can remember because he says, uh, Kalam, where is it? Ana nasi kathir al kalam ma'a kalam al maghrib or al gharib. It looks like al gharib, which means the West. They translated it as, I have forgotten much of my talk as well as the talk of the maghrib. And then they have a footnote that says, presumably Arabic. Al gharib means the West. When he was brought to the West, the, the, the America. So, right here, to me, it's pretty simple to uh, translate that. al gharib means the West. He's forgotten his language that with, with that of the language of the West. He is by himself. The only people he around, he's around are people who speak English. So, he's saying he cannot write about his life that much he can't because he has forgotten his language and somewhat replaced it with the language of that of the west okay it says ya ikhwati la tatlu la tatlumuni and that is oh my brothers do not blame me so when he says oh my brothers who do you think he's speaking to because my first thought is that he's talking to the people who he hopes reads this one day not necessarily the people who speak his language because he didn't write it in his native tongue he wrote it in arabic because arabic is a language which is preserved by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so back to this book where they made dua and asked that if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't allow them to prosper with Islam, that the descendants or the people who are of African American descent can indeed flourish in America with Al-Islam. So when he says, Ya Ikhwati, I believe he's talking to us. When he explains, Ya Ikhwati, please don't, don't blame me for not being able to give you more of my background, but what he did is he gave us what he could remember what was important to him which was al-islam suratul mulk as in he's saying hold steadfast to suratul mulk the 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 surah about the dominion of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the kingdom and then he ends his introduction with alhamdulillahi hamdan kathiran right so it's praise be to allah and much praise and then he says yawa Yuwafa min min nimat min nimat ma tazid min min al khair. Okay, so they translated it as praise be to Allah, much praise. He grants a bounty and abundance. But I think this is a message to the people that He is hoping this lands in the hands of, and He says, um, "May Allah grant you a beautiful." like a, a a beautiful may Allah bless you and grant you a like a beautiful success back to the dua that was said in this book they're asking the the slaves on that ship were asking or the slaves who were brought here whether it was a ship or not the people who were enslaved were praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking that their descendants would be blessed enough to practice al-islam on these shores so then we go into um his letter bismillah rahman rahim 
and he tries to write a bit about his life, right? And he tells about who his parents are. He can remember his the number of siblings he has. He can remember who his parents are. He talks about his birthplace being in, uh, is it Futaturo? It's uh, Senegal. So it says between the two rivers or seas. He sought knowledge in Bundu and Futa. And then they translated it roughly. It says, with a sheikh called Muhammad Said, my brother, and Sheikh Suleiman Kimba, and Sheikh Jibril. Um, when I read it, I have to go back over that. But he says here in his writing, he says, Ikhwati. Ikhwati or means my brothers. You know, it, it, it's translated as my brother. But then he says my brothers. He could be talking about his paternal brothers or his brothers in Islam and he named like two three people here but the way that they translated it is like he went and studied with his brother and two other people so then he goes into how um, there was an army that came to his country and killed many people and it took him and walked him out to the sea and told him, I'm sorry, and sold him. And, and um, yeah, it goes into how it, it sold, uh, they sold him. He's talking about uh, how he ended up on the ship. We sailed to the big sea. You know, and I'm not trying to go into the whole slave trade and how that works. You know, we can look all of that up. I really want to just... Um, focus on the surahs and the hadith that he speaks of. The book is very interesting. If you want to buy it, his story is very interesting. It's just the translation when it comes to um, surahs and hadith that I'm concerned with because I don't like, you know, for the wrong knowledge to be put out there about Holy Quran or um, hadith or anything like that. And What's really important is um, making sure that this uh, knowledge gets out there correctly. But it's better to be clear on what Holy Quran is saying and what Hadith is saying and not attributing so much greatness to a man, but at the same time trying to um, or bringing about the fact that Holy Quran is is ever existing, you know, the same for centuries and bringing about the truth of the matter. So here it says um, they translated it as I used to give alms zakat every year in gold, silver. I'm sorry, I skipped a page. O people of North Carolina, O people of South Carolina, because this is where he was brought, he was brought to Charleston, um, South Carolina, and he escaped from a cruel uh, master or slave owner and fled to Fayetteville, North Carolina. So that's another reason it interests me because, you know, it's close to home. So, um, O people of North Carolina, O people of South Carolina, O people of America, all of you. It says, um, where is it? before I came to this country, and this is what I, the way they translated this was, my religion, it says, my religion was the religion of Muhammad, so when, indeed, when he writes it in Arabic, and I find it funny that they gave such a faint copy of it in the book, so, you know, I'll try to put the stronger ink copy up so you can read it in Arabic yourself, but um, it goes into, He's, he's listing, he says, um, that his religion is the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so he believes in Allah, um, the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then it goes into, I walked to the masjid before dawn to wash my face, hands, feet, head. Um, he held, it says, I hold the noon prayers, afternoon prayers, sunset prayers. Now, I will give a bit of credit. The translator did say earlier in the book it says they're not sure, but they feel like he is actually writing 
out some hadith. So what I'm going to, the point I'm going to try to make here is that he lists the tenets, basic tenets of Islam, where he says he believes in Allah, he believes in the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, he would wash his face, he's talking about wudu, uh, and hold the prayers to give zakat, and then he says, I used to give, this is the rough translation, I used to give alms or zakat every year in gold, silver, harvest, cattle, sheep, goats, rice, and, what, and wheat, and barley. I used to give in all I used to give in alms. Okay, here's, listen. My take on that, this translation is very, very bad. Because, because as Muslims, even today in 2019, in my community anyway, we study and we practice hadith um, and we memorize them. And I'll insert a clip here where my brother-in-law is actually teaching the hadith and they list the exact same things that he's listing. This is traditions passed down from the Holy Last Messenger وسلم, to the people like in his own words where he said, I hope or I wish that the people um, who are to come later understand my message better than the people who are present in front of me. This was in the last sermon, Hijrat uh, uh, al If I remember correctly, I'll put it up here inshallah. But Everything that he's listing, um, it's all hadith, it's all written here, but this translation makes it sound as if he's a man, so Musa, you know, it makes it sound as if he's a king who used to give alms every year in gold, silver, harvest, cattle, sheep, goats, rice, wheat, and barley, all I used to give in alms. No, this is hadith he's reciting. Um, I used to walk to Mecca and Medina, as did those who were able. This is what to hujj al-bayt in kana la kamalun, to uh, make ziyarah or uh, visit, pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina. Um, in kana laka malun for those who were able or if you were able to okay <laughs> So this is where I feel like we need to make some corrections here and the, the um, translator, you know, who studied this should have conducted a conversation or spoken to someone who actually knows the religion and knows the books and knows in depth what this man is speaking about. He's writing it in Arabic, like I said before, because it's the preserved language. He knows that somebody else who studies this language is going to come across this. So maybe he spoke another language. Maybe he spoke Wuluf or something because he's from Senegal region or Futatur. Maybe, Futatur, I'm sorry. Maybe he spoke another language, but he knew to write it in Arabic because the language of Arabic will never get lost. So he goes on about his owners and such. I'm not really too concerned about that. but. There are some parts in here where they try to say that he is 
he converted to Christianity, but imagine he's living in a country that is foreign to him. He doesn't truly have access to Islam or Islamic studies or books or things like that that um, promote Islam, but he does have access to the Bible. He did say, Alhamdulillah, he's glad Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made available to him the Bible because it's the closest thing at that time that he could reach that, that came as close to Islam as possible. And they talked about how he went into the houses of worship or the church towards the end. And I'm not talking about when he ran away. If you read the book, you'll see where they're unsure if he ran into churches and all of that. But what I'm talking about is when he went into the house of worship, to, uh, to which was the church, um, in here they're trying to say that he became Christian. And that's not the case. Because apparently, if he had nowhere else to worship, if a church was the only place that he could find to worship Allah SWT, then definitely this is the place he has to go. He couldn't build a masjid. I mean, come on. So, um, here he writes Surah Al-Fatiha, right here, and this is what I was saying earlier, where he wrote a scene, where the scene, letter scene belonged, and in, in, in Surah Al-Mulk he was writing a couple of sheens where a scene belonged, but Al-Fatiha, excuse me, Al-Fatiha, he probably, probably remembered it a lot better, so he wrote it in that fashion, but then you have um, the Lord's Prayer, which I'm sure he was taught the Lord's Prayer living in a Christian household. He was taught the Lord's Prayer, and this isn't foreign to us to take something that is parallel to our belief or our way of life or our religion and accept it because it is it's the truth just because it came from um, a different religion doesn't make it any less true it's still you know the 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 lord's prayer is um our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done it's that's all true so it's okay for him to take that and parallel it with surah al-fatiha you know he's he said because the law Sharia, talking about the Ten Commandments, was given to Moses, and grace was given to Jesus. Um, and then he says, but first, I follow Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Awalan Muhammadan, an yusalli alayh, an yusalli alayh, you know, falhamdulillah. He's sending praise upon the Holy Last Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then, This is something really, it's common, even in 2019. Um, last Thanksgiving, we went to a church. Me, members of the community here, we went to a church for around Thanksgiving and for Muslim Christian unity. And I myself, when I was there, I recited, Joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore thee. No, that's not from Holy Quran. No, it's not from... Uh, hadith, but Joyful, Joyful, Lord, We Adore Thee is a church song. It's a song that the choir sings. I sing it in English, then I sing it in Arabic. And at the end, the pastor approached me and asked if I could teach his choir to sing. Do you understand? We've been doing this for years upon years. This is our way of life. This man, Umar bin Said, Allah bless him, he did the same thing. He just paralleled Al-Fatiha with the Lord's Prayer. It's very common because Islam and Christianity are brother and sister religions. You know, they are, they are close, very, very, very similar religions. And we do whatever we can to keep that unity between us. So he went on to talk about where he resides and you know uh, where he lives and the name of the county and everything about his his um, slave owner and all of that which I, I don't want to get into his um, life as far as I mean alhamdulillah he was well taken care of after being um, in the hands of uh, an evil uh, slave master but that wasn't my point you can read those those parts in here that's not even you know that's not the juice for me anyway, but the, the parts that I was most interested in were Holy Quran and Hadith. And the point that I wanted to make is that this man didn't 
become Christian. He nowhere in his book does he even say it. He doesn't even imply it. Just because he wrote the Lord's Prayer in Arabic, he can't say that's what made him a Christian. He's still praising God. He's still praising Allah SWT. He's not committing any type of shirk. And the thing is, we know, just like he, more than likely he knew, there's an ayat, um, he probably more than likely he knows about this you know if he studied this much holy quran if he studied this much of hadith then more than likely he knows about this ayat and we know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test us with um some loss and some hunger and you know of our money and our wealth and our lives and and things like that and glad tidings to those who are patient so he's, he's he, I'm sure he's well versed in Holy Quran based off of his writings of the Surah in, a, in, you know, in probably his second language based off of his memory and at the same time we also know this is our way of life because what we're taught is ala bi zikrillahi ta'ala or Holy Quran says ala bi zikrillahi tatma'inna al which is on or verily surely in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does the heart find rest? So what probably brought him his peace of mind was his remembrance or his zikrullah ta'ala. Then, you know, he submitted. You know, like it says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin And glad tidings to those who are patient. He submitted to his circumstances when he was in the custody of his second, or what is it, General Owen's brother. Um, you know, and when you submit, like, uh, those who came before us, Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, Nabi Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes that as falamma aslama, when he says that moment when Nabi, when both of the Anbiya, they submitted to that sacrifice, that moment is the definition of al-Islam. This man didn't convert to anyone's any other language or I'm sorry any other religion he clearly says in his language or in the preserved language in the language that he knew would reach the people he clearly says that he believes in Allah SWT and the Holy Blessed Messenger وسلم, he lists the tenets of Islam and he starts it off with Surah Al-Mulk that Allah SWT has dominance over the entire kingdom meaning the entire world. Um, all I can say is this is our way of life. For any Muslim, any any Muslim around the world, there was a, a young man who was jailed in Malaysia, or he was Cam Cambodian, jailed in Malaysia for um, exceeding his stay. His papers were expired, and they jailed him. And in order to find comfort in uh, his jail cell, he was reciting Holy Quran. I'll roll that clip as well. <laughs> you out if you were looking for this book the story is interesting it's just I really encourage you to learn to speak learn to read Arabic for yourself or whatever language you speak learn it for yourself so that you can have a clearer or better understanding and I'm very grateful to my Sheikh my Murshid Kamil because he he's the one who produced this book you know he studies he studied so much over years and had it not been for him producing this book 20 years ago, I probably wouldn't have come across any of this. It's all of high interest to me because obviously I want to know my own lineage, my own roots. Where do I come from? Do I come from America or was, or were my ancestors brought over here on a ship? You know, so I encourage anyone out there, please learn your history, learn your Arabic, learn your language, learn 
al-Islam, study it deeply so you can understand for yourself when you come across these type of books and you won't think that, you know, you won't be so easily persuaded to believe just anything. Read it for yourself. Just go read it for yourself after you've studied the language in depth, you've studied Holy Quran and, and surahs and sunnah and hadith in depth, then study it for yourself and then from there you read these books and inshallah you will be on the correct path instead of thinking or believing that it was so easy to persuade this man to um, convert to another religion. So with that, may Allah SWT bless you if you stayed here through the entire video. Allah SWT bless you. But like I said, this is our way of life. And may Allah bless you if you've stayed this long. And um, let me know in the comment section below what your thoughts are. And I will see you in the next video. Inshallah, tabarakatayla. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.